guys, I'm going to be introducing author Lila Ibrahim in just a couple of seconds. And uh, this is our second interview. I interviewed her a couple of weeks ago for her book, Mustard Seed. And um, the book that she wrote first is called Yellow Crocus. And uh, she's so gracious because I asked her, you know, if I read the book, if she would come on because it's kind of like a uh, a prequel to Mustard Seed. So I was so excited that she said yes. And I love this book. So um, we always have so much fun. I can't wait to talk to her. And um, I will do a video after our interview. And uh, so here is Lila. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be speaking again with author Lila Ibrahim. And she has both of her books because we're going to be talking about both of them. Uh, Yellow Crocus was first and then Mustard Seed. I love the picture on Yellow Crocus. Oh, and look at that. I love yeah, it. Wow. Oh, isn't it beautiful? This one is so powerful. Such yeah. a powerful. Where did you get that picture? Um, well, it's actually in the Library of Congress, and the book designer found this picture. Oh. And the two things, I mean, there are many things I love about it, but two things that really strike me are I love that this person, who uh -huh. I think of as Maddie, even though she's not, has her hand on the baby's head, which is just so sweet. That's right. She does. Right? Yes. And her dresses match. Wow. Which just speaks volumes to their relationship and the family's desire to have I mean to have the mat right like it's just your it's I think it's unfathomable to us the relationship that these two people had and that the society that wanted them to have this deep and meaningful relationship yeah. and then would tear that away from that baby right yeah okay so you know what I thought was the un most unbelievable part about reading Yellow Crocus was that that was your first book oh okay. thank you because okay I I, and I have so much to talk to you about, but I love first lines of books. You know, when you can get a good first line, you know, it just kind of hooks me in. And the first line in this book, and it's kind of like a prologue, but it still is the first line. It says, Maddie was never truly mine. And I was like, oh. it's just like, it. I was like, ah, oh, how did she do that? How did she get me at hello? <laughs> Because, you know, I knew a little bit more about the story going into this, okay? But as some, what, what I do sometimes is I'll read the whole book and then I go back and read the first chapter because oh. it has deeper meaning to me then because I've, I know what's going on just to see a, how that first chapter like hooked me, you know? And when I, you know, so I did that. I mean, of course it got me the first time, but the second time it brought tears to my eyes. Right. Right. You know? What's, uh, when I so the the first sentence of the first chapter, chapter one, not the prologue, I worked on a lot and thought about it and crafted oh. it and all this stuff. And then one day, I remember it so clearly. I was sitting in my kitchen and or standing. I was washing dishes. I remember I was standing up, and it felt like just plunk that prologue came to me, yeah. and like what it would be like for Lisbeth to just love Maddie so much and feel like she was her family and yet then to grow up and and have all that thrown into question um so yeah so that i i do uh, that, that and i also i just teared up when i when i thought of the when prologue. you think about it i know and i mean you were just so destined to be a writer I, I, you know, your gift, because these books are so good. And I, especially this week, like I've interviewed a lot of authors that they are, you know, it was like their third, fourth, fifth book. And that really made it, you know, like really, and, and they were talking about their first books, and they're like, they were okay, but then it took, you know, but then there are authors like you, like they just hit it out of the ballpark on the first book. So, you know, you just have such a gift. And I, I hope that I can say it enough because I feel like I feel like even when I do the intro and I've done other videos for Instagram and I constantly say it and I'm like, OK, calm down. But, you know, I'm just so blessed to have met you. And these books just touched me so much. And I'm going to tell everybody the story that I told you in the email. <laughs> Lila and I have been emailing and I missed her one email and then I found it. I don't know. I don't know what happens to emails. They go into this like email. 
<laughs> purgatory. <laughs> <My> purgatory. <laughs> Where they just hang out until somebody finds them. <laughs> and I was thinking, and I was like, I was going back looking for another email, and then I saw yours, and I was like, oh my God. How did I miss this? But I don't know. You know, the problem is it's junk mail, okay? You have to rid all your email of junk so you can actually see the ones you want to see. But So I want to show you this, okay? Oh, I love it. Oh, my gosh. So, so after great. I read Mustard Seed, um, I went and bought this. And I was looking at it because I use this all the time. But you can see it's still full, which is amazing to me because they're so tiny. And I just take a couple out at a time and I stick them in jeans pockets and and I'll put on a pair of jeans that I had worn before and I can feel that they're still in there so I don't have to like do it every single day but because they kind of hang out there but I can't tell you like how many times a day I will stick my hand in my pocket and feel those mustard seeds and it's like this reminder you know whatever's going on at that moment that you know that's all that's as big as my faith needs to be right then and then yeah. I'm like okay so just that's for that enough. second that's all I gotta yeah. do you know yeah. and it and it gets me through it really does. It, I love it. It, it, it changed, you know, I, I think you should start like a thing. <laughs> so, okay. So then, all right. So I'm reading Yellow Crocus. And of course, like, so the story goes back. I've already read Mustard Seed. It goes back. And I love that we start with the birth scene. And first of all, I didn't know that you were a doula. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Doula. Yeah, doula. Yes, I was a doula. So I was a preschool teacher for years, and then I was a doula for seven years. Wow. Because I yeah. thought that's what I wanted to do. So that's why I found it kind of interesting. I have oh, six right. children. I've given yeah. birth naturally oh, six. six. Wow. Naturally six children. And um, the one time... Okay, it's, they've all been different because whatever. Because my oldest son that's is birth. 30, and my youngest is 14. But um, the one that I had a midwife for... I would have been a C-section for sure because his head got stuck. I was in labor a long time and she didn't give up. You know, she was just like, we're going to do this. It's going to take time. You know, how committed are you to this? And I was like, I'm committed, uh, you know, right. whatever, you know, and right. you just have to trust them because, yeah. you know, because, you know, in the age of, Hos big hospitals and do they would have just wheeled me in you know it would have been like oh his head stuck c-section you know what it wouldn't have been a question I know that you know so I I really love the midwife I really love that I, I and my one daughter-in-law actually uses a midwife and she's given birth in tubs and oh, you yeah. know my granddaughters are born yeah in the tub and she did that whole thing but I just for a doula like you're just somebody who comes along like while they're in labor Right. right. So we provide physical, emotional, and informational support before, during, and after labor. So we do meet with people ahead of time and talk them through the process. And like I'll, you know, people will call me when they have questions. And, and sometimes I'll answer kind of easy medical questions, but oftentimes mm -hmm. I'll say, you need to talk to your practitioner about that. But things like what's normal and are these feelings normal and what's the best car seat to buy or how do I, you know, those um, kinds of things. And also the emotional changes within the family that happen, we talk about a lot. So, um, yeah, someone just to companion you through it because so often, when you go to a hospital or anywhere, you have many different practitioners that are with you. There's nobody who's holding the whole experience for you. And if, I mean, even you, you've done it six times and that's a, a lot. <laughs> a uh, lot. <laughs> not many people do it six times. You know, most people now do it once or twice, maybe three times. And you can't be an expert on this your first time. And the pressure that's put on partners to be a support when the partner is scared and hardly knows what's happening. Yeah. So that's where it comes in. Yeah, I really wish I would have had one. <laughs> yeah. That's why I always thought I wanted to be one because I've been with my um, friends, sisters-in-laws. We kind of yeah. showed up for each other. Exactly, because... and that's what a doula is. I mean, you don't have to be a professional to be a doula. Right. You know, it's in, in the, not even that long ago, it was aunts, it was cousins, it was friends. Yeah. Women were around each other for birth. For Right. We supported each other in birth. You don't need to pay someone to do it. You just need someone who can companion you. Yeah. Yes. And, and it's interesting because um, when we were kind of each have, it was kind of, we went back and forth. One of us would be pregnant. One of us be giving birth. One of us would be, yes. be nursing, you know, but what I loved about it is that 
I don't think that the partner can really help them because they see the pain and we were all committed to no drugs. Okay. So we were committed and you have to be, you have to be committed before totally going in, be. you know, yes. you have to be, you have to say, I don't want yes. drugs. And, but you know, when you're at that point, when you're like, I may want a drug and you talk, you know, it's like, you're good. You're good. You can do this, you know, and, and it really helped. We always helped each other, talk each other out of the drugs because you get to that wall and you're like, no, I can't, I can't. And then they're like, no, you can. And, and there is something about women, a woman telling you that instead of, yeah. you know, because they're not emotionally invested. Like, you know, they're going to survive. <laughs> exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just a very different thing for a partner than it is for a friend or someone supporting you or someone who knows has been through it and can, you know, I now I'd often say to my clients, well, can you make it through three more contractions? Right. And they would go, okay, I can do three more. And then they forget to ask again. Right. right? Cause you hit that wall. It's just like running a marathon or any hard thing. You hit the wall and you think you can't do it. You keep going. Well, just like in mustard seed, you keep yes. going. Oh no, not in mustard. No seed. mustard, in yellow crocus. Mustard. Yeah. No. Well, in my new book, oh, I, your new I, book. Oh, I, you I go into it about that. Like you think you uh, can't do it. And all you have to do is take the first step. And after you've taken the first step, you realize you can take another and then you take another and another. And before you know it, you're in your new life. So wow. that is like, that's true with birth, right? Like you just get through this contraction and then you get through the next. Right. Stop thinking <laughs> about how, you know, and they want to tell you the doctors are like, okay, eight and a half, eight, nine. And you're like, <laughs> But my last son was born during the Super Bowl. And so <laughs> there was a TV set in the room and everybody's crowded in like because I had other kids. I had five children, other children, and they were some of them were older. And then my brother and friends and they're all watching the Super Bowl. And I turned to this woman nurse who came over and I was like, kick them all out. Totally. I cannot I was believe like, you let like, do that. Because that noise and trying to constant, I was like, get every single, she's like, what do you want me to say? I'm like, I don't care. I don't care what you say. Make, make something up. I don't care. <laughs> Just get everybody out of this room before I kill them all. <laughs> so, you know, it's just... You know, anyway, she did it, but I didn't have anybody there at that time that could help me. And I just yeah. was like, when I saw that you did that, I was like, of course, that's why you had it so down in Yellow Crocus, right. you right. know? Yeah. I well, and interestingly, when I wrote Yellow Crocus, I had been to friends' births, but I hadn't yet, like, done the doula training and stuff. Bella, stop. Sorry, stop. <laughs> that's okay. Um, and uh, and I even sent the, the scenes to some midwives asking them, could you look this over and make sure I got this right? They were like, yes, you nailed it. <laughs> yeah. So because I wasn't as confident at the time. Yeah. Right. It's very cool. So I just thought that was a really cool thing because I was like, oh, I didn't even know that. But of course it makes sense. But yeah, the relationship. So what I couldn't believe because I didn't know. Now I knew about wet nurses. Okay. But I didn't know that slaves could be wet nurses. I, oh, right. I just Not didn't know be, it. For forced to be, right? For forced yeah. to be. I had no idea. I don't know why I didn't know that. Well, whatever. I guess I just never read about it. But, you know, it was shocking to me because she had to. So they had to go out in the field, find somebody who's nursing, right? I mean, I guess that's what they did. Yeah, isn't it crazy? That's or crazy. or not in the field. I mean, they would get a house slave or, you know. Oh, house, you know okay. It's just so bizarre, the whole and like in this case, they were going to rent someone, right? They were going to rent. I don't know if you caught that, but yeah. they had rented someone who got sick, which I was just even the I, like I before I wrote this didn't realize that like renting was a thing. I was like, oh, my God, it's so disgusting. It's just bizarre. The whole thing is so bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. And just yeah. to think about the fact that, you know, like as her, Maddie as like so she leaves her son, her three month old yeah. son and and then she's got to take and, you know, not that color matters, but I mean, it kind of does at that point because you take a white baby so unfamiliar. So, you know, and, and be like, OK, I'm going to nurse this baby now. And who's your oppressor, right? Yeah. Like this person represents everything that's harming you. Yeah. But then, OK. And then she, you know, like she takes her in and she becomes so attached and then they're like, oh, sorry. Like, now she has a baby brother. <laughs> On to the next. <laughs> On to the next one. First of all, let's just talk about the fact that that woman's milk was just, like, almost eternally <laughs> coming in. <laughs> Look, you know, but that's, you know, as a nursing mom, we can all relate to that. We're just like, okay, so she's just yeah. nursing a long time. 
but, but you know, it's just like that attachment. And then, but of course they stay attached and, and then I, I, when I went back, okay, so I get through yellow. This is such an emotional thing. I'm like, okay, take a breath. Cause I get, it's such an emotional book. Um, both of the books. So I get done with yellow crocus and I, I go back to mustard seed to reread it's because oh. now I have a whole different, right. You know, get to the end of mustard seed, cry again. Okay. <laughs> But but in a good way, like it's not. I don't want people to think it's depressing because it's not. It's good. Like it's a you know, it's a yeah. great ending to the both of to to that. I, you know, I guess you're not. You're not. Like, are you done with them? Or are you? Thinking- I am not done with them. Yeah, it's interesting to see the next you know parts of their stories percolating. So I um I I definitely have an idea for a World War Two book, and I definitely have an idea for a night. Uh, 2000s book interesting like, yeah modern so i my intention is to bring them all the way forward mm. so i'm going to do something probably in the 1900s and 19 well yeah that's what i have to figure out yeah probably so you're like going to bring their generations yes wow that's yeah. really cool i was really hoping you weren't i was like a lot of authors are like no i'm done i'm done writing yeah. them you know but yeah but I think with these people, like they, they have so much history, like it would be cool to see them into the 1900s and see where their families take them. Like, yeah. I think that would be so cool. So, you know, anyway, I'm done being very emotional about it, but, <laughs> but I just, they, I just can't believe they're your first two books and they're just that good. And you should just be so proud of them, really. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. And, you know, so Yellow Crocus, I think I said this on the last time, like the story came to me and I felt just called to do it. You know, yes. sometimes you just know you have to do something. And it really was just ridiculous. I'm like, why would I write a book? Um, and so I really had to teach myself to write so I could write their story because their story was just so important I to me. I can't believe you say and- I had to teach myself. Like, I mean, seriously. Just to even I come know. up with the, the the prologue of that book, I was like, oh, my God, like, that's her first, like, it's just crazy to me that you had to, like, yeah. think that you had to teach yourself because it just seemed to me like it, you're just very natural at it. Well, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. So yeah. I did write down one of my favorite quotes. I can't see because okay. I don't have my glasses on. I have to bring it closer to me <laughs> um, because I told you about the first line, but then yeah. this, and this one's only like two or three pages in. Because we don't do spoilers, and that's why we're talking, like, around these people. Uh, But we don't do spoilers. But it says, once she opened the door, her life would forever be divided into before and after. And that was another one. That was like, uh, how am I going to make through this book? This is just the beginning. How am I going to do this? (laughs) But you know what? How I did it is that their stories are so rich. And, you know, it's not... Constantly, the reason I'm just saying it's a tearjerker is just because it is that full because you can put yourself there in that time period. And just so everyone, because if you haven't watched our first video, you should, you should go back and watch it. But this book takes place in the end of the 18, I wrote it down, 30s, yeah, end of 1830s. And then the other one picks up after the Civil War. And you had described in our first video about how you picked this place in Virginia. So could you just tell everybody who hasn't seen that video how you decided that? that- yeah. I, I liked the idea of it being a more northern state. And I think um, partly it's because even the northern states thought of the southern states as unevolved, right? Like way down in Alabama or down in Mississippi. Right. Um, and it's very close to the capital. It's like 100 miles from which the U.S. Crazy. capital, which yes. is just crazy for yes. us to think about. And um, it's very close to where the country was founded, Right. Yep. So Williamsburg in that area. And then it's also very close to Ohio where they would be free right. um, if you just cross the Ohio River. So it's the next town, next state over. Um, so it just felt like a complicated place situationally. And originally I thought I might do it like a plantation actually across the Ohio River. Mm-hmm. So like on that side, you'd be free and on this side, you'd be enslaved. But then what I learned is that they didn't have large plantations in Western Virginia because of the rolling hills. So it's, it just wasn't conducive to the large plantation um, situation. And I, I definitely wanted it to be on a large plantation. And so that's why I moved it a little further east. Well, I don't think it's a, a spoiler to talk about the yellow crocus 
as a plan. Uh-huh. You know, I don't think yeah. that's too much of a spoiler. I, it was yeah. interesting to me because um, when they talk about it as a sign of spring, Yes. And so what I found really interesting, because I kind of went back to look at some history and I really couldn't find that much. I was like, well, her his, what she did for the, you know, for her research was way more extensive than what I did. But to find that they realized that they could run or, you know, like try to run when they got the first sign that that it wasn't going to be frozen, that things were starting to bloom. Right. I mean, this is what I. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, tell me if I'm wrong. Tell me if right. I got this wrong. No, but... but you wanted to wait till spring to try to escape because of the freezes and, and just the weather conditions and such. Um, yeah. Yeah. But so, before the rivers got too high as well. So Right. Like it was that perfect that. time, right? Yes. In the beginning yeah. of spring to do that. And, yeah. I was, you know, it was kind of like, of course, that's like a sad moment because you're thinking, you know, every year at that time, they're like, well, this is it. Like... Are we staying, you know, are we going or staying? You know, what are we going to do? And Maddie, of course, had, you know, we're not going to spoil it, but she makes that decision a couple of times, you know, as the, because her husband keeps wanting to go. And, you know, sometimes she doesn't want to, sometimes she does. And then other times she doesn't want to, which is like, I think that was the struggle because when things were going well and every, you know, she was like, okay, well, you know, I get to, I get to be around my family. It's not that bad. I get along with these people, you know, they don't treat me like what is, what does it look like if I leave as opposed to, you know, I'm getting fed, like all the things, you know, that are getting provided for her, you know? Yeah. 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 I, you know, and I've read quite a bit about that era and it's amazing how many enslaved people chose to stay and like chose in very conscious ways. So I was just reading a book called um, Jefferson's Daughters. It's a nonfiction book yes. and it's about his yes. three biological children. And um, I saw that. Uh, one of his daughter, his um, <laughs> Sally Hemings, yes. who um, was his wife's half sister, which is just bizarre, but right. true. Um, and the mother of his, some of his children, um, when they were in Paris, she could have just stayed in Paris. Like she was free when she was in France. Right. right? And, but then she would have never seen her family again. And so, I mean, we don't, there's no writings about why she chose to go back, but, but the person who was, who wrote the book just talked about that fact and that one of her brothers did stay decided not to go back. So she has a brother who stayed in France and who was there at the same time she was, and she chose to go back on the boat. So, um, but what she did get, which is in writing is Jefferson's agreement to free her children, to free whatever children Mm. they had together. Um, yeah. So crazy, just crazy. But, but, but you understand why people want to see their family again. Like, Oh, absolutely. Would you choose to never see your children again? No, you'd be like, okay, these aren't the best conditions, but at right. least we're together. Right, exactly. Yeah. And they were being, like I said, you know, a lot of the times this wasn't always the case, but a lot of times they were being provided for so well that yeah. they couldn't see how they could possibly do better. You know, even though they were, quote unquote, a slave, they were like, I, you know, we're eating, we have a roof over, you know, we have heat, we have, you yeah. know. <laughs> you know, the, right. just, and, and their children are being provided for. I mean, it isn't until sometimes when things start going bad that they're like, okay, we have to get, you know, it's time, yeah. you know, we got to get yeah. out of here. But yeah. I am so excited to hear the fact that you are doing more on them because I do think that they have more story in them to talk about. And so, but you're writing, are you writing something else right at this moment though? I am. So okay. I, I had a two book contract and the first book was the sequel to Yellow Crocus and then the second book could be on anything I wanted. And so that book is uh, about a young woman named Mei Ling and she becomes a paper wife in southern China in 1923 and emigrates through um, Angel Island to San Francisco and Oakland. So in a paper wife is someone who's uh, on on paper, it's a different person than who you actually are. Right. And how that happened for her is that the person she marries when, so he was coming from the United States to bring his wife and son back to the United States from China. And while he was on the way there, his wife dies. And it it was, there was such prejudice and such bureaucracy. It wasn't like he could go to the U.S. consulate and say, well, my wife died. Let's change the visa. I now have a new wife. Like they wouldn't have believed him. So then, so all they do is have her pretend to be that wife and come through. Wow. Yeah. That's a, where did you find that story? 
Well, it's a, from a few places. So the first time I thought about it is one of my good friend's mothers said she was in her mom's uterus on Angel Island. Wow. So I was like, wow, that's really that's interesting. really cool. Yeah. So her mom was pregnant with her on Angel Island. And then I went to Angel Island and there, the immigration detention center is still there. It, it almost got torn down, but it wasn't. It was there from 1910 to 1940. And there's all this Chinese poetry carved into the walls um, of people who had been detained there. And it's their wow. despair just carved into the walls of being basically caught in a bureaucratic limbo. Um, and, and so that's super powerful to read that poetry. And then it's funny, my friend's daughter cuts my hair and she said to me, you know, my grandmother's mother wasn't even the sister who was supposed to get married. My grandmother's aunt was the one who was supposed to marry the man and she got sick. And they had already paid the dowry, so they just had her go instead. Wow. And so I was like, whoa, there's a story. So then I just started reading about the era and reading about um, these paper families, and there was tons and tons of them. And so, and in the 1940s like, and 50s, there were all these um, people who ended up like going to college in the United States, getting their PhDs, and realizing that their families had lied about who they were, like what their name on paper is, is not actually their family mm -hmm. name and why, and had to do with the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, the Chinese are the only specific country that the United States created a law saying you can't immigrate here from there. Um, and that was in the uh, 1890s. So a lot of Chinese were brought in um, to build the railroads and to build the Delta in California. And then when that was done, they wanted to stop Chinese immigration. And so they passed a law saying you couldn't come here. But people who had been born here, would have been that got taken to the Supreme Court. And so the Supreme Court said, no, if you were born here, you're a citizen and your children are citizens. And so that's how these people, the paper people, started coming in in the, in the 1900s. Yeah. You know what? That's what I love about you guys, these historical fiction, because you guys find these stories and then bring them to life. And we right. get to learn so much, like more than I ever learned in school. Okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. like I learned more yeah. from and, your team. And have empathy, right? Yes. And have empathy. And, you know, I learned more from these two books about the Civil War time and just the real people that it affected, you know, from their point of view than I ever learned in school or, you know, so it's like, I love being able to travel to these places and times and, and learn and, yeah. you know, be involved and. Right. You know, it's amazing. Now, these covers, so we talked about the the one cover on Yellow Crocus and yeah. um, the one for Mustard Seed. Did you did you get a choice for that one, too? Like, did you have a this say one in that? I did, um, this one I had less choice in. They actually, like, for this one, they yeah. gave me three options. Oh, and that I one is. I agreed just... with this one. It was very obvious. Yeah. This one, I think there were two options, and this was definitely the best. I don't love the look of these women, but it has definitely grown on me because they're, they're a little passive for my taste, but in some ways it does represent the fact that you kind of have to be a little, you know, sneaky or under, yeah. like they aren't like, Oh, powerful women. Right. They are, but right. you don't know it when you look at them. And this does represent that. And I love, but I love like this and yes. kind of the ominousness of it and the motion of it. And I think it really does. And then, and then, like the idea that someone said, it's like they're comparing their lives. Yeah. And it's true. They are comparing themselves to each other. Yeah. Especially yeah. when you get to the end. Like, I think that that, yeah. you know, you really yeah. can look at the cover. And, and the fact, I love that it's kind of blurred, that their faces are yeah. a little bit, I don't know, it leads to kind of the mystery about, and, the, and the background blur. It's yeah. a beautiful cover, yeah. you know, I, yeah. I like that. I really like yeah. Yeah, I do too. Well, you have to have to tell me when your next book comes out. Is it, okay, do you, great. Do you know when your next book's? Do you have it'll like a date? It'll be November 2018. Yeah. <gasps> yes. I don't have an actual date, but it'll be next November. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. Well, and have you, you haven't read Living Right, right? That's my foster child book. I did not read. <laughs> wow. No, but I did see. I had on my other notes, and then I guess we never got to it, and I was like confused what I wrote down, why I wrote that down, and I was like, I wanted to talk about it, and then we ran out of time. So yeah. tell me a little bit about that. So living right. So when I had written mustard, uh, yellow crocus, um, I had an agent that 
that asked for the whole thing, read the whole thing, liked it, ended up taking a pass on it. But as we were having a conversation, she said, what else do you have? And I was like, what else do I have? I don't have anything else. <laughs> My first book. <laughs> what do you mean? This is hard enough. But I was like, an agent wants you to have more. So yeah. I kind of made up a story. And then just like the first thing that came to me. And But then the story kind of resonated in my mind. So Living Right is modern fiction, and it's a story of an evangelical Christian mom who sees that marriage licenses are being given out in San Francisco in 2004, and she lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. And she decides she's going to stand up for her family values, which is traditional marriage, and takes her kids and the church youth group to um, protest, or yeah, protest. And then um, the next day, her son attempts suicide. And she learns that he is gay or in her parlance has same sex attractions and, um, and she's devastated and he's devastated. Like he doesn't want to be gay. He wants it taken away. And they go and they talk to their minister who says, Oh, you can be cured. And so he gets into conversion therapy. (coughs) So it's about the whole family's journey, but mostly from her point of view of trying to reconcile her faith and her love for her son. You know, it's really interesting because I have a family member. I'm just going to say family member. And he is a very conservative Christian. And um, he had a son. He adopted a son who, when he got to be like 20, you know, came out as gay. And and he, to this day, and this man is very elderly now, um, believes that he will be cured, that his son is going to be cured. Yeah. But... I know the man and, you know, and he, we just laugh about it because it's, like, it's, it's just kind of funny, you know, because yeah. you just don't and it's, it's funny when it doesn't control your life or doesn't hurt you. Right. right. I mean, I used to laugh about conversion therapy. I really did. There's a movie called, but I'm a cheerleader. I don't know if you've ever seen yes. it, but it's ridiculous. Right. And you laugh at it. But then as I started doing the research, I realized like how many people, you know, are devastated by it. And I mean, the suicide rate for gay teens is so much higher than straight teens. So, um, so I really just felt called to write this story, even though it doesn't fit into the historical fiction genre. And my publisher wasn't interested in it because it doesn't fit into the yellow crocus mustard seed historical genre thing. So that I self published and it's, it's, I feel really good about it. Like I had a moment where this book could save someone's life, like literally literally save someone's life. Yeah. And, uh, and I can't just leave it sitting in a drawer. I have to get it into the world. Yeah. And I, you know, what I love is that, you know, so I have a lot of children, (laughs) but it seems like, so my son is a senior right now, my fifth son, my fifth child. And he's, I, what I see in him is that it's changing and, you know, like nobody cares. Really. I mean, he doesn't understand why anybody ever cared. I have to explain it to him, which is awesome because it's really the next generation coming up. And, you know, when he was involved in the election and we were talking about different things and he said to me, why is it a thing? Like, who cares? And I'm like, you know, what's awesome is that you have that, that you get to say that now because in my generation, you know, I'm 53. That was not the case. Okay. And, you know, what's pretty shocking to me is when Facebook came out. A couple of years ago when I got on it and I'd see um, people in my class and then I'd see that they had were, you know, gay and had same sex marriages. And I like I was thinking who I didn't know that. But see, now teenagers aren't. And I'm sure that I am. No, it's not perfect. I know that. But I also know that it isn't as it was that they had to wait until, you know, however old they were. Like now they can feel a little bit more comfortable and it's changing and it's and it's a good thing. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah, it was a good thing. So my kid, one time we we're sitting around the dinner table and I said to my children and, and there were it was a bunch of us, like it was a, a larger like twelve people, like three right. different families together. And I and they were talking and I said, Do you know that like none of us knew anyone that had two moms or two dads growing up? Right. And they were like, What? what? I said, no, like none of us knew anyone who had two moms or two dads. And they like looked at each one of us and they, they're they all the adults and they, all the adults are nodding. They're like, wow, that's crazy. Absol- <laughs> so I am grateful for that level of generational change. Um, uh, that's what so, I'm saying. It's absolutely, yeah. absolutely different. And yeah. Uh, and poor Jen is, I mean, my main character, her name is Jen. And in some ways she's caught up in that, right? Because she's like, so sure she's right. And yet she's in this culture that's telling her, 
no, you're not. And she's struggling with like, what, what values are enduring? Like what about Jesus's message or her religion is enduring across time and what can change, which I think is a very profound question for any religious person to ask, right? What's, what's enduring about your faith and what is going to change over time? Exactly. And I was raised evangelical, um, uh-huh. not as conservative as like my parents and, you know, it, because yeah. it, things do change. And it yeah. was changing as I'm raising my children, because I did take them to church. But the older ones will say, well, you changed so much. And I'm like, no, everything changed, which was, um, which is amazing. You know, it's like, oh, I get to question. And it was like, in my adulthood, that I realized that these things that had been kind of just forced into you and not just that I mean lots of lots of things like lots of different things and then you're like you grow up and you're like oh wait a second okay that was you know that's that's not it and and so I was able to as these other children were coming up and say you know you know this is this is what I believe now and this is what the church and the church has changed a lot I mean uh, you know but there are I'm not saying they're not Not out there right no I'm not saying that but they definitely and um we had talked a little bit the last time about Unitarian churches and those are churches that have definitely stepped up and made that change and made it comfortable for anybody who wants to go to church and not feel uncomfortable in a church yeah. in a church yeah. setting you know so yeah, yeah. Which I yeah. Love about it. well good I'm glad that we talked about it because I did see it and I didn't know I don't know it must have popped up somewhere on your site or you know on Amazon and I wanted to ask you about it and we just never got around to it so I'm yeah. really glad we yes. got to talk so about it so if you decide to read that one I'd love to talk I, to you about y- that. yes you know I will <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I bet you'll cry at the end of that one too. I, I bet I do <laughs> I bet I do. And I just, because that's what I love about your writing is that it just has like even yellow crocus, you know, like everything is symbolized and everything relates back to family and faith. And I just, you know, I love you. You know that. So, (laughs) but I definitely will. Good. Then we get to talk again and then we get to talk again in November. So it's all good. (laughs) So so anyway, hold those up for everybody. I'm going to have Lila's, um, she's on Facebook. I think Facebook's the only thing you're on, isn't it? You know, I do have an Instagram account and I yeah. do Oh, that's have... right. I just found you on Instagram. Yeah. And I do have a Twitter account, but I don't use them a lot. But Instagram, I go to quite a bit. Instagram's so, yeah, fun. That'd be great. Instagram's yeah. fun. So we'll we'll put your Instagram account too. I found you today and I was like, yay, there she is. I got to like put a little <laughs> at sign. And <laughs> Well, you have a great day, Lila. Thank you Thank so you much. We'll too. talk soon. Okay. So great to talk with you. Okay. Good. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for watching Lila and I. That was so much fun. And as you heard, if you made it to this point, is that we will be talking again, which I cannot wait. So I will be reading her next book, which is called Living Right. Um, I'm going to be looking that up as soon as I get done here. So anyway, I will have Lila's links underneath here. And um, if you loved watching us, please hit the like button. And if you want to get an update every day on the videos I do, uh, hit subscribe. Thank you.